Hello everyone, welcome to this video where we will discuss coded track circuits. If you remember, I made a video on DC track circuits and I will put the link in the description below. So fundamentally speaking, DC track circuits, the way they work is that you have a battery which is then connected to a light bulb. It lights up the light bulb. But if you were to short the circuit, then the light bulb would be off. To put that into perspective, imagine that the train tracks are completing the circuit. When a train moves on top of the circuit, that will then turn off the light bulb, thereby indicating that this section of the track is occupied. Now, in reality, it's not light bulbs, but it's actually relays. This relay is energized because a battery is connected to the relay. This relay is de-energized because now a train wheel is shorting the circuit and this relay is again energized. So that's how the central computer would know that this section is occupied and these two sections are free. In a very simple term, DC track circuits basically mean that you have a DC source connected to the relays and in AC track circuits, you have alternating current source connected to the relays. Now, AC track circuits have a lot more nuances, but we will not get into that in this video because this is about coded track circuits. So let's go to that. As we just discussed, one of the basic functions of AC and DC track circuits is vacancy detection. On top of that, Another thing that these track circuits are able to do is broken rail detection. Because if, let's say, the rail is broken, the wheel is not here, but let's say the rail is broken, that broken rail will again disrupt the circuit, or because of broken rail, the circuit will not be complete, and because the circuit will not be complete, the relay will be de-energized, and because the relay is de-energized, the central computer will think that the section of the track is occupied, and if it's occupied, it will not let another train come into the section, thereby making the whole system safe. So these have been predominantly the functions of AC and DC track circuit. But on top of that, what coded track circuits is able to do is also transmit information to the train. So not only vacancy detection and broken rail detection, but also transmitting information to the train. How cool is that? So let's talk about how this in coded track circuits, you are able to transmit information to the train. Going back to the fundamentals, let's say there's a metal rod and this metal rod has free electrons. Now, just based on the property of those electrons, this electron will have an electric field around it. When you connect this metal rod to an alternating current source, this electron starts oscillating up and down. And because now this electron is oscillating up and down, it generates an alternating electric field you'll see just now so the alternating electric field looks like this and also anything that has an alternating electric field will also have an orthogonal and alternating magnetic field now if you have an electron which is generating the alternating electric field and the alternating magnetic field that magnetic field will then put some force on the electrons in this other rod, which will then also cause this electron to oscillate. So basically, what we just did is transmit information from this rod through air to the other rod, meaning this is now acting as an emitting antenna and this is acting as a receiving antenna. So now to put that into perspective in our track circuits, in our coded track circuit, the way that works is that you have a transmitter the transmitter is completing a circuit with the receiver and the source is an alternating current source, meaning now you have electrons going back and forth in the tracks. Actually, in reality, the source is not a simple alternating current source. The source would be something like this. And I will explain in a minute why have I picked these three waveforms. But going back to the logic, imagine electrons are going back and forth into the track. This movement of electrons back and forth into the track, as we discussed in the slide before, will result in emission of EM waves from the track. So now your track is acting like an emitting antenna and it is transmitting EM waves into the air. EM means electromagnetic waves, which has both an electrical field component and a magnetic field component. Now, if you have a wheel on top of the track circuit, that wheel will then short the circuit, meaning now the current will go through the wheel. So if you were to place an antenna in front of the wheel, in common railway terms, we call it pickup coils, or you can call it pickup antenna. If you were to place that 
then if the EM waves are emitting from the track, they will cause electrons to then move inside these pickup antennas. And because of that pickup antennas, essentially what you have done is transmitted a signal from track to the train. So you receive the signal, you filter the signal, you amplify, you decode, and essentially now you have a workable signal with information inside it that is then used by the train. This diagram also very clearly shows that, that you have uh, transmission in the rail, which is then picked up by this, which is then used by the CPU on the train. This is just an example of how pickup coils look like. And these are the three different waveforms that I will discuss now. So why I picked those three waveforms is because uh, fundamentally, these are the three types of coded track circuits that we have in use today. One coded track circuit will have DC pulses, and the modulation is called OOK, which means on-off keying modulation. Or you could have on-off AC pulses, like the AC pulses are on, then they're off. So you could have on-off modulation on an AC pulse. Or the third one, which is more complicated, is frequency modulation, which is also called FSK, frequency shift keying. The way it works is that if you want to transmit a zero bit, you will have one frequency. If you want to transmit one bit, you will have a different frequency. So you will have different frequencies which will be transmitting information to the train. So now let's look at the first variation, which is pulse codes. The way these pulses are sent are either in the form of DC pulses or in the form of AC pulses. Now the codes are essentially number of pulses per minute in that if you're sending these many pulses per minute, that's one type of code. If you're sending more pulses per minute, that's a different type of code. Uh, let me explain that a bit more. So what that means is that if you are sending, let's say, no pulses, train would be driven at a maximum speed of 20 miles per hour, and this is the aspect. If you are sending 75 pulses per minute, it would interpret that as moving at 30 miles per hour. That's my speed limit, and that's the aspect. So as you keep going up and up, which is more pulses per minute, here you see 75, 120, 270, 180 pulses. So as you keep going up, every single pulses per minute will mean a different code. So if this is code 120, that means it's 120 pulses per minute, 270 would mean 270 pulses per minute. And every when any, each of these are received by the cab equipment, they'll interpret that information as this speed and this aspect and that would show on the driver display like this. So it would tell you the speed, it would tell you the aspect. There's different variations of this display, but this is essentially how pulse codes work. There could be tons of variation, tons of nuances, but in terms of the logic, this is what pulses basically mean. If you want to know more, there's a whole Wikipedia page dedicated to pulse code cap signaling, which tells you all the nuances of this code. To put that into perspective, what that means is that when your central computer knows where the train is, where the second train is, what the state of the signal is, whether the signal is green or whether the signal is red, if there are any permanent speed restrictions, temporary speed restrictions, if there are switches. Based on all of that information, the central computer will then send speed codes to each and every coded track circuit. So what that means is that if a train is driving and if there's a red signal, the train receives an AB speed code. So while it's on this track circuit, the train will be able to drive all the way up to 80, but it steps onto the second track circuit. It will have to slow down to 60, otherwise there will be a penalty break. Same way the train will have to eventually slow down to zero as it approaches the red signal. If the signal is green, the train can keep going on at the maximum speed. Same way if there is another train, then the train eventually slows down to zero before it reaches the back of the train. This is just examples of the displays that the driver could be seeing based on the speed code that it receives. So this is how pulse code cab signaling basically works. There's tons of examples of this being used in the world. Lots of lines in North America that use pulse code cab signaling. And there are more like variations of pulse code cap signaling that are being used. And not only North America, it is also used in a lot of European systems. So like London Underground, Victoria Line, before it moved to CBTC, was using pulse code cap signaling. There's Dutch signaling systems. There's Russian signaling systems. The next one, which is a lot more complicated, is AC frequency modulated speed codes. What that means is that instead of sending pulses, now you are sending bits of data 
data, and then you are modulating that information on an AC frequency uh, by using something called frequency shift key. So if you want to send zero, you'll send one frequency. If you want to send one, you'll be transmitting a different frequency. And based on that, you're able to transmit zeros and ones. So now you're able to transmit data. And now you can transmit more data than just speeds. To give you an example, I found a research paper that explained TI-21 track circuit. There could be multiple variations of it, but the one variation we were looking at showed that you can send up to 63 bits of data. Some bits will indicate target distance. Then you all can also send target restriction, left door, right door, track circuit markers, target and current speed, gradients. Like you can send a lot of information through this frequency modulated waves that is then transmitted in the track. What that means is that instead of just knowing the speed, so in pulse code signaling, we just knew the speed. Now the train has a lot more information. Now the train knows all of these things. And because the train knows all of these things, it can do a lot more precise stopping on the exact target point. And it can do a lot of other things. So because now it has all the information, the train can have an aggressive driving strategy, a normal driving strategy, or a very slow conservative driving strategy. Because of all the information that now your cab has, you can have something called ATO. What ATO means is that now your driver will only have to press buttons, only have to look for obstructions, but the train will drive by itself. So all of that can be enabled by having that much information, which you did not have with pulse-coded track circuits. Some products, the information of which I could get easily from the internet, are these AB Track 200, 400 micro tracks by Ensaldo, Electrocode. So there's all these products, and I'm sure there are more. And if you know them, please put that in the comment box below. But these are different products that use the frequency modulated coded track circuits. Last but not least, I would like to talk about one very important benefit of coded track circuit. One of the benefits of coded track circuits is that it is a lot more resilient because now you send a certain code through the transmitter and when that that code is received through the receiver receiver then compares the code with the transmitted code and if it receives the same code as the transmitted code then it gives a vacant versus not vacant status what that means is that in general when you have a lot of sources of interference such as if you look at this diagram you have pantograph arcing you have return current paths you have signaling currents you have emissions from rolling stock you have emissions from substation you have all sorts of stray currents when you have all of that there is a chance that when your train is on the track circuit even then your receiver could be receiving some current your track circuit could indicate that track circuit has been vacant but now because of coded track circuit you're not just only receiving current you also have to compare the code, meaning whatever code is transmitted, it has to be exactly the same as receiving code. So now if you have stray currents or other sources of EMI, it will mess up the received information. And if the receiving information is not the same as transmitted information, the comparator will say, okay, no, it's not the same. So I will declare this track as not vacant. That would mean that coded track circuits are a lot more resilient. There's also some information on the internet about coded track circuits of the frequency modulated form. You can find that on different Wikipedia pages. This is one of the pages. If you look into cab signaling, you'll find some information here. So I hope that has been very helpful. Thank you so much. <laughs>